So welcome to the additional online lecture for Business Technology and Innovation. Uh, this is the additional lecture because I didn't really quite make it through uh, the entirety of lecture four. And next week in lecture five, with, uh, we uh, discuss um, business uh, technology and organization strategy. And I want to start with a clean slate, so therefore I will do the rest of this lecture online um, and post it on uh, YouTube as well. Um, so, um, we started the lecture this morning uh, with uh, an explanation of what business models are. And I explained that there actually are four distinct parts to a business model, which is uh, first of all about the innovation or the idea you have. Um, uh, second is the market, so who will buy your innovation, who will adopt your innovation, who will buy your uh, new product or service. The third one is cost and revenue. How much does your um, um, innovation or technology cost? How much does it yield in terms of uh, revenue, different revenue streams? And finally, there's the organization that you need to take into account. So how does your innovation fit into the existing organization? Or if you would create a business model from scratch uh, on your own, what, uh, how would you organize around your innovation? So. Um, what structure would your organization need? How many people would you need to hire? Uh, where your stakeholders, etc. Um, I also explained that um, the business model you have to write for your course is a bit different than a regular business model because, of course, we pay more attention to um, explaining the different parts of the business model uh, theory based. And a more practical business model, of course, doesn't really have that, but does have good documentation for every different aspect of the business model. And you see that many aspects of what you do in the business model for your assignments is actually quite similar to uh, writing a real business plan. Um, so this, um, your assignment and this lecture as well, I think is useful not only for this course, but also for you know, maybe your future work if you want to start a new business yourself or if you are responsible for um, setting up a new product or bringing a new product to market yeah. it's useful to know what the elements of a business plan are so this is what we explained um, and so that the business model consists of like four distinct parts about the innovation market cost and revenue and the organization and i um, explained that a well-known model um, for business models is the business model canvas. So the business model canvas has been uh, developed by two scientists from Flanders uh, uh, and uh, is uh, used very often in practice as well. So uh, in organizations, if they want to uh, implement a new product or for people who start their own company. And this provides an overview of nine different factors that you need to take into account when uh, designing your business model, writing your business plan. Um, so, of course, these nine are maybe a bit difficult to remember, but they match nicely with the four elements of the business model as I discussed before. Because um, this is in detail, um, your value, prop value proposition is about the innovation uh, or your technology or product you bring, bring to market. The market part is customer everything customer related, so your, your different customers and their needs and wants, the customer relationship and the channels, cost and revenue is the cost structure and revenue stream, and the organization is your key resources, organization partners and activities that you need in order to actually you know bring your innovation to market and um, make the product to provide the service. So we also discussed the value proposition, so the first part uh, of the innovation uh, of the business model canvas. Then I explained that the value proposition explains what your innovation brings um, for the customer in terms of either a need that the um, innovation fulfills or a problem that it solves. Um, in the chapter by also all there are uh, more um, examples of needs and issues but they all basically boil down to okay we're able to provide the product in a better fashion or provide a completely new product so it's still mostly about needs uh, or problems that are solved by the customer um, but then again you can also innovate in other aspects so for example if you can do the same thing in a cheaper fashion you can innovate your internal process 
so that you can make the same product cheaper, for example. That's also an example of innovation that can also be part of the uh, of a business model. So uh, everything they mention is also um, can also be part of the value proposition. So it can be a new need entirely. It can solve a problem. It can increase the performance of an existing product. You can customize products. Um, so differentiate your existing portfolio of products. Um, you can design your products in a better way than it is you know, currently is. So make it more accessible, more convenient, more usable. Um, you can try to you know, you know up the marketing of your products so that, so that you can create kind of an image around your product, your innovation, or you know, create your brand image. Um, you can make it cheaper, um, and you can also maybe uh, innovate in order to mitigate risks you have. So you know. Um, and design product in such a way that you take away um, part of the competition. Um, important to realize also is that um, the value proposition is tailored to different customer segments, so to different adopters. So last week we talked about um, the diffusion of innovation process, so the value proposition for you innovators is different from the earlier or late majority, because the innovators derive, derive different value from your products than Late adopters. So, for example, innovators may adopt your product because they think it's cool, while um, late um, late majority may only innovate your product because they think it is useful. Okay. Um, so, the value proposition must match the organization strategy. So, if you and uh, design a, a, a write a business plan for a new organization or write a business plan for an innovation in an existing organization, you need to take into account if the innovation matches your organization. If not, you often see that uh, larger organizations create a spin-off of the innovation, so they create an entirely new company around the innovation. Um, so you have to take into account, okay, is this innovation suitable for the organization we're in, and does it stand a chance in the wider market? Um, which basically means when you um, write your business plan, you have to take into account the societal, industry, market, and firm level. So on a societal level, you have to think about, okay, does this innovation actually match um, the, the, the wider society that you're in? So does it uh, fit the economic uh, situation in the country? For example, is it too expensive? Does it fit the social norms? Uh, in an organization um, or in a, in a country or a culture? Um, uh, does, it fit the, does it fit with the laws or regulations? Uh, are there any other factors you need to take into account? So there is a tool that you can use, a management tool that you can use to take all these societal factors into account, which is called a pestle analysis. And uh, we will talk about that next week when we talk about organization strategy because that's part of an organization strategy as well. Um, so for example, if you take genome testing or Airbnb, there is a so th those are innovations and they're innovations that people actually want, but you need to take into account wider society. So genome testing is not accepted everywhere. Uh, in some countries there are even laws against genome testing. Um, and uh, similarly with Airbnb, so if you want to innovate with an Airbnb-like platform, you need to take into account that in many, um, sort of in many, um, um, in, in many countries, there are, there are specific regulations um, about um, Airbnb or general Airbnb use. So even in some organizations, not even allowed. So the industry level is um, thinking um, uh, about whether your innovation or how your innovation fits within the competitive markets and the sort of immediate surroundings of your organization. So are competitors working on it? What's, what about the suppliers uh, that uh, supply the parts for your innovation? And the tool to do that is a five forces analysis. But again, because that's such an integral part of an organization strategy, we'll discuss that next week. The third level is the market level, and that's the specific market your innovation is located in. So what is happening in the current market? Is your innovation completely new, or are you just jumping on the bandwagon after um, many people already adopted the innovation? So are you the first 
person to come up with, for example, a smartwatch or are you only entering the market now, uh, now that we're in the face of the early majority for uh, adoption? Because that has consequences for how you bring your product to market and the people who will adopt your product, etc. But the tools for this are the diffusion of innovation process and the uh, technological S curves that allow you to kind of investigate okay, where is the innovation um, located in the whole adoption process and in the whole technology diffusion process. Um, so, for example, okay, um, the te smartphone technology has kind of matured. Um, we have an ID for a completely new type of phone. Um, so maybe we can introduce a discontinuity in the market and come up with a completely new innovation that maybe will take over um, regular smartphones. Or maybe you decide, okay, so many people have adopted the smartphone, our innovation will not bring enough new um, to the market, so we just quit the innovation entirely. So that's the market level. Finally, the firm level is taking into account and right to develop your position. How is the innovation located within the organization? Do we have everything um, in place in our organization to make the innovation happen? Uh, can we build the product? Can we provide the service? Can we provide customer service? Um, the tool for this is um, a value chain analysis, which we will also discuss next week and the week after that. So that was the first part of the business model canvas, the value proposition related to the innovation. The second part is the market uh, that your innovation is located in. So this is about thinking about who are your customers and what do your customers want. Oh, sorry. So who are your most important customers in terms of demographics, you know, age, uh, sex, uh, location? Uh, psychosocial uh, characteristics, what is the personality and the identity of your, um, uh, of your ideal customer, um, what are their needs, um, what are the gratifications and motivations for adopting the innovation if they want, and what's their willingness to pay, how much would they pay for your innovation. And, um, again, this differs for each um, different customer segments. So your, your innovation can, um, can have a one target group who is mostly in it for the identity and for the, you know, for the cool part, while another uh, target group is mostly in it for because it is, they perceive it as useful. Um, so it's not that you have one type of customer, you can identify different customer groups in terms of demographic, psychosocial, gratifications, willingness to pay, etc. And tailor your innovation and the marketing for your innovation to each of these target groups. Um, you also have to think about what type of market are you aiming for? You know, is, are, the, is, are the people who want to adopt your innovation is that everyone or is there right a specific group who will only adopt your innovation is it only a specific group of people in terms of demographics is it only a specific type of organization is it only governmental organizations so what is your niche uh, or do you even have a niche or do you aim for the mass market so is your product segmented uh, or diversified as well so do you have is your innovation one product with, for example, different versions for a different market, or do you have one product for one market? Um, and finally, um, do you may, maybe you have multiple customers? So think of um, think of the Android platform or, or the App Store from Apple. Um, their customers are not only us people who buy the apps, but their customers are also the organ the um, developers who create apps. So they have a multiple sided um, market, both business and consumer, and within business customer, different types of customers. So customer segments identify who are your different customer groups and how you can you classify them in terms of their demographics, psychosocial characteristics, etc. And of course, what's very important is that you are able to connect your value proposition. So what needs uh, does your innovation fulfill or what problems does it solve? Do you connect that to your customers? Because if you don't have a customer segment for the um, solution your innovation can offer, 
you don't have a good innovation. Um, so customers have needs or problems to be solved. Your innovation offers these solutions or gratifies those needs. And the tool to do this is called the value proposition canvas, not the business model canvas, the value proposition canvas. So it connects customers and the value proposition, and there is a different value proposition canvas for each segment. Um, so this is the um, value proposition canvas as originally developed. Um, I think there is a better version in the next slide. Now we can explain this quickly. So gains is the benefits that the computer, that the, cons the customer uh, expects. Uh, pains is the risks that they may encounter when adopting the process. Uh, for example, you have to learn how to work with the new technology if you adopt a new technology, which is a pain. Um, and the customer jobs is just a description of, okay, what does the customer want to do? In terms of the uh, innovation, um, it's a gain creator. So how does it um, relate to the gains of the customer? Pain reliever, how can you take away the risk um, that the customer uh, customers may experience in adopting your innovation? And products and service, just a plain description of what your innovation does. Um, so this is an addition to the value proposition canvas, which I think explains it a bit, bit better. Um, because it does not talk about gains, pains, and customer jobs, but it talks about wants, fears, and needs, and benefits, experience, and features. And I think especially the benefits, features, and experience is a bit more uh, concrete. Um, so features are the objective characteristics of the product. So what does it do? How does it work? You know, the buttons and what happens if you press a button, if you make a new product. The benefits, um, The benefits is an explanation of what your product does, what can your product provide um, for the customer. So they either give the customer pleasure or they decrease pain related to the, the, the needs and, and the problems. And finally, the experience is more related to the user interface and about actually working uh, with uh, with a new innovation or actually adopting the service, it's about the emotional connection. So, what does it feel like when you use the product? Is it easy? Does it feel cool? Uh, does it give you a, like a warm feeling? So, it's about the design aspect. And these are connected to the customer's wants, needs, fears, and maybe substitutes. So, their wants are the you know, emotional drivers of purchasing. Um, so what does the customer actually want from the product? So what problems does it solve, needs to gratify? Um, and those are connected to, you know, to the experience uh, and the benefits part. Um, so it's the emotional decision. Um, the needs are more like the rational things that the company, that the customer thinks about. Okay, why well, would I want this innovation? Um, and so the, the needs that are um, sort of things that a customer needs to get done. Uh, those needs don't always have to be um, conscious. It can also be hidden needs that, that so which, which are called latent needs that the designer, um, latent needs that you can target as an innovator or as a company. Um, so for example, if you uh, support a music player, no one ever thought about having a device with like 10,000 songs with you uh, before the arrival of the first iPod. But suddenly when it was there, um, a hidden need was uncovered and everyone wanted one. So those are the needs. And finally, uh, you have the fears of the customers, which is related to the pains. So what are the risks of switching to your product um, or adopting your innovation? which of course is related to, okay, is it hard to, to do? Um, do I need to, uh, um, to set over all my um, contacts from one phone to another, uh, et cetera. So it's the pain of switching. 
And finally, substitutes that relates to the alternative that, we, that people may have instead of adopting your innovation. So maybe adopting another innovation or not adopting the innovation for something else entirely. Um, so as an organization, so as someone who wants to implement an innovation or um, just put a new product, bring a new product to market, you need to take into account what the customer wants, their emotions, their needs, what they actually, uh, so, so their, their, their beliefs about what the product can offer, their fears, take into account substitutes and connect those customer um, factors to the benefits, the features and the experience that your product provides. Okay, so that's about, that's the connection between the value proposition and the customer segment. So, of course, um, you define the value proposition for your innovation, you define your customer, um, your customer segments uh, with their, with what they, um, with, with their needs and their wants and their fears, and you have to connect the two to each other in order for your innovation to be a success. So um, the third part of this model canvas, uh, also related to the market, is customer relationships. And this part of the business model considers everything about acquiring and retaining customers. So it's basically marketing. Um, but not only marketing, but also thinking about, okay, how do I organize my organization in order to make this work in order to acquire and retain customers because you don't only need marketing you need uh, a good sales team you need after sales you need loyal customers you need good service you need to have a quality product um etc um so this course is not about the marketing part uh, there's another course um uh, which runs concurrently to this course um which deals with marketing communication um, but we will discuss how a customer relationship management system uh, works in an organization and what the most important factors of a customer relationship management system are. And this is a system that organizations use to track their customers and potential customers. And we will do that in lecture eight. So the final aspects of the market part of the business model canvas are the channels. So uh, channels relate to basically every customer uh, contact point. So it relates to marketing, sales, and after sales, and it's a it's uh, it's basically similar to what Roger says about the fusion of innovation. You know, people have to become aware of the products, they evaluate it. Um, so the whole customer journey is part of the uh, is part of the channels aspect of the business model. So when writing up a business model and thinking about the business model, you have to think about okay, um, what are the point of contacts? How will uh, a customer uh, first learn about my innovation, uh, where can they find information about the innovation, uh, where can they form an opinion about the innovation, where can they buy it, and how do we take care of these sales and uh, delivery and after sales. Um, so again, this is not specifically part of this course to think about all the marketing aspects of the organization, but it is part of a business model to think about these uh, aspects. So it's not only marketing, of course, it's also delivery and sales itself, which of course it's also a part of marketing. Um, so if you think about things like um, how do we sell our innovation or provide our service? So is it um, is it an old-fashioned brick and mortar store, for example, where people can buy a product? Um, uh, do we sell it via our own website or own channels? Um, or do we sell it via a third party? So, for example, do we sell, if you have a complete product, do we use bolt.com or amazon.com to sell our product for us? Um, or um, do we sell our product in the blocker or media market or other real life brick and mortar organization? So, how will you sell your product? And of course, these channels can be different for different customer segments. So, um, again, mass media campaigns are. Um, uh, a common tool in order to have uh, a large part of the customer base adopt 
and innovations that would have really made majority. Well, for example, special events and niche stores are maybe the channels you want to use to target innovators and early adopters. So the channels part is thinking about, okay, how, what are the points of contact for customers and how do we take care of everything uh, so that we can provide optimal service for our innovation. So the third part, business model compass relates to the organizational aspects of uh, the business model. So it's relatively easy to come up with a new fancy new idea for a product or a, you know, with a technical innovation. Um, it's also fun to think about, okay, who will buy it? How can we market the innovation? Um, it's usually a bit less fun uh, for many people to think about, okay, how do we then organize our internal organization so that we can actually um, provide the products or service to our customers? So what do we need to do? Um, but of course, this, this is an integral part of your business model. You know, without thinking about how you organize stuff, you cannot innovate and you cannot bring your innovation to market. So you have to think about the organizational aspects of an innovation in the business model. This, again, if you would write a real business plan for your own company, this is one of the key aspects that, that business plans are judged upon. So if you go to a bank with an idea for a new, uh, for a new innovation, for an innovation, um, banks will look at how you define the organization around it as much as they will look at the characteristics of the innovation itself. So, organization part. So the first aspect of the business model at uh, Canvas is the key resources, which relates to what key resources does your innovation require. Um, resources is not only raw material, no, so it's not only what comes into your organization and then you have some machines that what comes out. Resources are um, wider than that. So resources is the raw material, any machines uh, you need, uh, um, capital you need such as buildings. Um, it relates to the financial capital you need, it relates to the people you need to hire, the knowledge you want in your organization, uh, to the information technologies in the organization. So basically the resources are everything that you need in order to make, to create your innovation. Um, so from buildings and raw material to the people and the uh, information technology you need to support um, people's activities. So the second part is the key activities. So from these relate to all the processes in your organization. So once you have all the resources in place, how these resources connect in order to create your innovation. Um, so that kind of relates to the overall strategy of the organization. Um, you have to do an analysis of your value chain again. So, okay, um, if you make a complete physical product and raw material comes in, um, then it has to be manufactured, then it has to be, um, uh, then you have some logistics, then it has to be sold. So what happens in all these steps? If your innovation is a service, um, for example, a, um, an app that you want to develop, then you have to think about, okay, how does this process work? Okay, how, how many people do I need? How will I work on the app? Who will do what? How are the specific parts of the app related? Um, who does what when, like simple, well, simple uh, project management. So what are the processes in your organization? Um, so you have to think about the process in your organization, how information flows through your organization so everyone can do their work when they are required to do it, so that everything runs smoothly. And finally, of course, you need to take into account the structure and culture of your organization. Um, if you have like a very formal organization, which is very hierarchical, and you have an ID for an innovation, okay, let's, let's develop an app, then it will not work because the way that our people used to work in the organization that does not fit the agile way of developing apps that um, is normally used when apps are developed. So you need to take into account your existing organization as well, the structure and culture of it. So that's the key activities. Finally, the key partners. Um, 
is everything you need outside of the organization in order to make your innovation happen. Um, so it's your suppliers, your partners, so maybe you outsource part of production, uh, maybe you have joint ventures that you work together with another organization in creating the innovation. Um, so we have to think about, okay, who else besides we have within our organization, who else is involved in the innovation? And you need that in order to maybe drive efficiency gains. Okay, you can, if you want to start a new fashion brand, you can, you can create the clothes yourself, but maybe you can outsource that to another organization, preferably somewhere in Asia where it is cheaper and people have the experience to do it. So it's be more efficient, you reduce your risks and you acquire resources that are not in-house. So you need to think about what are we going to do ourselves and what do we need other people for? But of course, this is risky, you know, if you say, oh, we have a great idea for a new fashion brand, uh, could you help us? And you run the risk of people stealing your ideas. So you have to really do a five forces competitive analysis in order to estimate the risks um, of getting outside people involved. So in some key resources, key activities and key partners are the organizational aspects that surround your innovation, like the internal parts, so the back end part of your innovation that you also need to consider when um, creating a business plan and coming up with your business model. So basically, the organization aspect said in order to support your innovation, you need to take into account the overall strategy, the structure and culture, the people in your organization, the IT in your organization. And not coincidentally, those are exactly what the next couple of lectures are about. So about strategy, structure, culture, people in IT and organization, marketing, I don't compliment this course. Finally, we have cost and revenue streams that, of course, you need to take into account. So if you come up with an idea for new innovation, you need to know what are the costs, how much will it bring in terms of revenue. And in order to do that, you have the cost structure part of the business model canvas and you have revenue streams. Um, the cost part of the innovation is is um, yeah, it's based on the organizational building block. So once you have an idea of the resources, the activities, and the partners of your organization, you can estimate the costs. And there is a difference, of course, between initial costs before launch and concurring costs, so costs after uh, launch um, of the innovation. So some innovations are like extremely expensive to create. Um, beforehand, but once they're there, they're very, very, very cheap to uh, sell. Think games. Developing a game co can cost hundreds of millions, um, but when the game is there, distribution costs are next to nothing. So most of the costs for game development are upfront, which, needs, which means you need to find investors who can invest in game development or you need to acquire some other form of capital um, that you can use to develop the game. Other products cost relatively little to develop um, but are very expensive to create. Maybe like high-end fashion and crunchy computers. Um, although in general the costs before launch are more expensive than concurring costs after launch because it takes a lot of time and money to develop an innovation. So costs are the initial cost before launch versus cost after launch. They're fixed versus variable costs. So um, um, like a game costs next to nothing once you have the game, but a phone um, will cost, the so production of each phone will cost a couple of hundred euros. So, so it has more fixed costs. Um, finally, you need to think about, okay, is our innovation cost or value driven? Um, which basically means, do we want to develop an innovation which is as cheap as possible? So think um, the, the little, um, or do we want an innovation that is like value driven? So people adopt the innovation because they um, think it's cool, because it gratifies a need, um, which means that your innovation can be more expensive, it can cost more, um, and you can also spend more money on it. So think little versus Albert Heijn or um, cheap, Chinese knockoff phone versus an iPhone. 
which is also Japanese. So those are the costs. And then finally, maybe the most fun part, is thinking about the revenue streams. So that means the revenue that you will derive from the innovation. So, and this involves thinking about the willingness to pay. So how much are people willing to pay for your innovation? Um, and not only how much they're willing to pay now, but also how much they're willing to pay in the future. Um, so maybe the innovators are probably more willing to pay more for the innovation than the late majority. That's why phones drop so much in price after um, being launched initially, because the innovators will pay anything um, and it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so that the mass market can adopt them as well. Um, so maybe you want to set a price for different customer groups and, and calculate how much revenue you expect to derive from the innovation uh, after a set period of time. So what is your return of investment? Um, which basically means you have to set up a revenue model. So you have to think about, okay, what is the one-time uh, revenue we derive from it? So once people adopt it, is there recurring revenue? So for example, if you buy an iPhone, uh, you need to buy um, uh, Apple earbuds for like 300 euros. You have to buy a charging cable for 100 euros and uh, you know, whatever you also need to buy when you buy an iPhone. Um, so there is an, uh, you have an app store in which you can uh, buy apps, you can buy music, etc. So there is a lot of recurring revenue once people buy a phone. And there is also one time revenue if people buy a phone. So there are many, many different types of revenue models, which we'll discuss in the next slides, um, th that all make money in a different way. And you usually see that companies have different types of revenue models at once. So they don't rely on one revenue only, but have different revenue models um, that bring in money. So you have to find out who are my customer groups, what are they willing to pay, uh, what are the initial, um, what's the initial revenue, what's the recurring revenue, uh, how many times will people adopt the innovation, uh, what is a return of investment, etc., 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 in order to develop the revenue model. Moreover, you have to think about setting up a growth model, which basically is that you have to think about what will happen in the future. Um, so how can we increase profit? So we can increase profit by increasing revenue. So can we come up with other things that we can sell to people? Uh, can, can, um, can we increase our customer base? Can we, have, can we, have, can we sell upgrades to existing innovations? Um, and how can we reduce costs? So you can, ex for example, increase revenue by finding additional customers. Uh, so selling your innovation to different customer groups that you have not thought of, that you have not uh, targeted before. Uh, you can think of additional sales or so upgrades, um, replacements, uh, new phones, uh, plant obsolescence means that um, you know, after a while, your phone becomes slower and slower and slower in your computer as well, which basically is kind of can be a strategy of a, uh, a company um, so that you have to adopt a new product because it just simply stops working after a while. Um, or you can think about subscription models, you know, that people pay uh, something every month for using your adoption. Or you can think of many different ways to increase your sales, and to increase your revenue. You can also think about reducing costs, you know, once the innovation is in place, can we make it in a cheaper way? Can we outsource stuff, uh, et cetera? Um, and you also have to keep an eye on the competition. You know, what does the competition do? Maybe someone has come up with a new way of, of selling the innovation cheaper than you do, or they have um, uh, copied your innovation, but then better. Um, so which may decrease revenue um, and also in turn decrease your profit. So that's a growth model. Finally, I want to explain a bit more about different revenue models. Um, so there are, like I said, there are many different revenue models. So it says business model here, but it's an error, sorry. But there are many different revenue models that you can use to generate revenue in today's economy. And especially in the way that we um, adopt products or adopt services or buy products now, 
gives many more opportunities for organizations to actually make money than you know simply selling stuff um, so these are i think it's more than nine it's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve sorry um but this is not an exhaustive list uh, this is just an, these are just examples of different ways to generate revenue so let's discuss uh, a bunch of them No, I have no clue why this is uh, Adamex. So to start out, boringly, um, you can have direct sales. So um, maybe it's, sorry, I think it's maybe somewhere. No, oh, well, never mind. So let's just discuss all these and then let's just see what, uh, when we will come across all of them. Um, so let's start out with user fees. And this is a revenue model in which you just charge people for the amount of time um, or the amount of processing capacity, or you charge people for a certain amount of using your product or service. So think of the failing scooters. So you can rent them and you pay for each mile or each minute or whatever uh, that you use the scooter. Uh, think of a hotel that you simply pay for each night that you're there. Um, but there are also other uh, uh, ways. So for example, Amazon um, now makes a significant portion of their money by um, not selling books or other products online, but by providing web services to other organizations. So for example, they provide uh, storage capacity, they provide processing capacity, they provide security and remote computing for many, many other organizations. And they just pay on a used basis. So they pay per the amount of megabytes or gigabytes or terabytes that you use, the amount of processing time that you use. Um, so you have you charge customers a fee based on the extent that they use a product. That's one example of a revenue model. Another one is basically similar, but it's just a subscription fee. So it's not usage based, but it's but it's um, paying um, a subscription for uh, so a set amount of money, and in return you receive a set amount of the product or service. So for example, I now pay for Office three six five because the university stopped uh, supporting my uh, uh, laptop. Um, so I pay I think seventy euros each year for me to use Office uh, 365. Um, on the right, there's like a Blue Mon. Um, so, uh, so it's an online flower delivery company. You have the subscription, so you pay, like, I think, uh, 40 euros a month or so. And each, uh, every month you can, twice a month or whatever, you get, you, you get sent a new bouquet of flowers. Um, your phone. Um, Subscription uh, is not similar, it's also a subscription fee, of course. Leasing is again pretty similar to a subscription fee. Uh, it basically means that you pay a set amount of money in order for you to receive a product that you can then use. Um, and usually it's kind of a service in which you pay a set amount of money, you get the product, and you get a lot of additional services beside the product. So it's a bit different than the subscription fee that may usually offers more. So you're leasing a car, and you never have to worry about um, 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 about insurance or about um, your car breaking down because it's all in the uh, leasing fee. Licensing is a bit more fun. Um, licensing relates to um, selling your assets, usually intellectual capital, for another organization to use. So for example, uh, many games like FIFA, they pay a lot of money to the FIFA and to other to football clubs um, in order for the game to be able to use the faces and the shirts of the clubs and uh, sport clubs, football clubs involved. Um, I sometimes play Gran Turismo and Gran Turismo pays a lot of money to Different car manufacturers in order for them to use the um, uh, to, to use the cars that are in the game. But of course, franchising is also uh, an example of licensing. So franchising means that you um, 
that you basically have your own company. So for example, McDonald's is uh, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, McDonald's are franchises, which means they are not really part of McDonald's, but they're people who own the uh, McDonald's franchise. They have their own company, but they just license the products and the logo and the marketing and a lot of other stuff from McDonald's. So they have to, so they have to make sure that they, um, that they have their own company, they have to make a profit, they have to pay their own employees, but they pay McDonald's a fee, uh, a huge fee, so that they get their products of McDonald's shipped to them, that they get all the marketing, that they get a big letter M um, in their front yard, etc. Franchising is a form of licensing. This is modern direct sales, um, which basically means simply selling your product. Um, and this is what we discussed before when we talked about uh, on the customer channels. So how, um, so it depends on your type of innovation, how you sell your product. So you can have your own stores like H&M and Apple stores. And you can have your own websites such as uh, food delivery websites for the restaurant itself. Um, you can also sell through partner sites, for example, like Thuis and, uh, and uh, Uber Eats. Uh, or use Amazon or Ball.com as your platform for your selling your product. Um, or you can sell your product in other stores, you know, if you, you can sell your peanut butter in Albert Heijn. Or you can sell your television not only via your site, but also via the media marks or other, or other uh, company. So modern direct sales basically means people simply buying your product. Oh, sorry. The next one is virtual goods, which basically is a form of direct sales, only then for non-real, they're real in a sense, but um, for, yeah, for virtual goods, you know, so you can buy Pokemon's uh, upgrades, um, uh, you can buy upgrades to Farmville, and especially now games, you know, like Dota and uh, Fortnite, they, um, they rely on the virtual goods model for their entire existence. So, you know, it's playing Fortnite is free, um, but if you want to call Aftar, um, then you have to pay in order to upgrade um, your, uh, the person you play with. Similar for Dota, it's free, um, but if you want a, a cool looking avatar, you have to pay. Um, so that's virtual goods. Which is actually a very good way of making money. So I think I think that Fortnite made well, over a billion in those additional sales uh, last year. So the next one is freemium, which basically means that you think the product is free or it's free to use to a certain extent, and then if you want to use the product um, more, you have to pay. Think. Dropbox, you know, can use it up to a certain number of gigabytes. Once you're over that, you have to pay uh, for additional gigabytes of storage. Uh, Tinder, you can swipe all you want on Tinder, but if you want to, you know, uh, redo your swipes or uh, re uh, pretend you're in a different location or whatever, you can buy uh, a Tinder subscription for, I don't know, I've been on Tinder for a while. Um, so those things are called freemium and uh, they're also a good way of first getting people hooked on an app and then charging, charging them for extra, which is kind of similar to the virtual goods, of course. So the next one is the middleman. Um, this means being having a revenue model which, is, which provides a service which is in the middle of two other companies. So actually you do something that used to be done directly between two other companies. So I think Booking, Thousand Short, PayPal, who are in between, so Booking is in between hotel guests and the hotels. And they get revenue both from us booking a hotel and they get revenue from the hotels themselves. I think Booking become mostly get revenue from the hotels. So the middle one. Next is a subscription model, um, which basically, well, um, is a bit, well, I, it kind of relates to the previous one we discussed, but I think another fun example is uh, of a subscription model is, another subscription model is like Gillette Fusion. So it doesn't look like a subscription, but it basically means you buy uh, the shavers or the Gillette basically for free, so it's very cheap. But if you want to buy new knives, 
um, it's very, very expensive. So basically a printer can also basically be seen as a subscription model. So basically the printer is giving away for free, or at least um, what you pay for a printer is way below the production costs and they make money, a lot of money by selling inked. So inked can basically be seen as a subscription to your printer, printer services. So our next one is on demand, which basically means that you get something delivered when you want it now. Um, which may seem similar to direct sales, but with direct sales, you actually have to you know, put some effort in selling a product, getting it delivered, but on demand means that it's kind of direct delivery. So think, um, you know, like a beer taxi, think Deliveroo, uh, doesn't even exist anymore, so think Uber, or um, but also think the, um, um, that you can have uh, ball.com select, um, when you pay like 10 euros a year and then you when you order something at ball.com you get it delivered you know the same day uh, or maybe the next day in the morning um, so it's kind of relates to the on-demand economy we have of uh, wanting products to be delivered quickly okay well, let's do two more um, the marketplace is simply providing a marketplace where you can um, attach sellers to buyers. So when you come, when you can connect sellers to buyers, like Airbnb, which connects um, hotel or hotels, which connects people who have a place to sleep, people who want a place to sleep, or eBay, who connects people who want to buy something, people who want to sell something. Now, finally, as a alternative business model, is like a reverse auction, and this is basically when you um, when you kind of really switch around um, who actually is the customer. Um, and I think this is a very interesting way of, um, um, of generating revenue for organizations and making things relatively cheap for customers. Um, so if, um, an example is collective energy in which like a bunch, like a couple of thousand consumers um, connect and form a kind of a platform or, or community and they go to um, utility companies who provide electricity and they say okay we are 2,000 households and um, we need this amount of electricity and gas per year um, how much are you uh, willing to offer us so uh, what is the cheapest price you can give us for 2,000 households which are guaranteed uh, uh, use of this and this amount of gas and, uh, of energy. Um, and then they just go to different types of companies and say, oh, well, and they pick the one who is cheapest or has the best offer. This is a reverse, uh, that's why it's called a reverse auction. So that's a lot of different revenue models. And of course you don't, you should not remember all of those for the exam. Um, but you should be able to think about different revenue models for different products. So, so, and also for your business plan, you can think about, okay, maybe we, we have invented a product so we can, we can sell, but maybe we can do something more. So maybe we can have a subscription based model. Maybe we can give it away for free and then charge people extra once they adopt it. So it's just ways of thinking about how to generate revenue besides direct sales. So as a final example, and then we really quit the lecture, um, is non-customer revenue models. And that's um, ways of generating revenue without actually having your customers pay for um, the product or service you provide. Think Facebook. Um, so they, we are not the customers of Facebook, the advertisers are Facebook customers, so they pay Facebook. So Facebook makes money by advertising. So location-based advertising, in-item promotions, uh, banners, affiliate marketing. So everything that you would learn in a marketing course you can use to generate additional revenue. Uh, this is how television works. You know, it's free, but they make money by advertising. Um, so we are sort of the customers for television programs, but advertisers are other types of customers. But television still needs to cater to us, but they make money with a different type of revenue. So they don't charge us usually for watching television. Netflix, of course, has a different revenue model, subscription model. 
Um, you can also be a data broker. So you can give away your product or service for free and then sell information um, about your customers or other information to other um, organizations, which is also what Facebook and Google do. Um, so you can sell location-based data, you can sell user data, Google can sell your browser data uh, from Chrome, um, Google uh, Maps can sell your rise and travel data uh, to other interested companies. Um, so they are data brokers. So we are kind of the customer from Google and Facebook, etc. But actually, they make money by selling our data to other organizations. And finally, you can make money by which is investment based you know you can develop a cool looking startup or innovation and then just sell um, your innovation to another company um, or um, you know uh, um, uh, acquire funds from investors you know from bank, banks and hedge funds and this is how many starts up initially make money so they they don't actually sell anything uh, at the start or many many organizations especially those startups in silicon valley don't will never make money that just exist in order to convince hedge funds and banks to lend them a lot of money that they can then use to invest in their startup and then they hope that they can sell their startup to another company which is also what the hedge funds and the banks hope for um, because it's hardly ever a success but when it is a success everyone will make a huge amount of money um, so that's investment based. You can also do that, of course, in a non in a non uh, for a non profit in a non profit way, um, for example, by acquiring grants or asking the government for a uh, for a grant or uh, initial funding for your project, which is not profit based or for hedge fund banks, but simply asking non profit organization to um, sponsor your uh, innovation. So that's it. That's a lot of different ways that you can make you that 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 you can make money. So this was the last factor in the business model contrast, the revenue model, thinking about how your innovation will make money and how your organization will continue to make money after the initial launch. So that was the business model contrast. Let me switch to um, the contrast itself. So we basically oops, discussed all of those. So we discussed the value proposition. We discussed the so the aspects of the innovation. Um, we discussed the customer relationships. So how uh, does the innovation uh, relate to your customer segments? We discussed the organization part of the business model canvas. Okay, once you have your idea for the innovation, how how what what does the backend look like? How do you organize so that you can actually create your innovation? Um, and we talked about cost structure and revenue stream. So what costs are in, um, do you incur for the innovation initially and uh, recurring costs after launch? And how will you make money? And together, the cost and revenue structure is the growth model. So how can you make a profit um, for a long or longer time period? So that's it. That's the end of the lecture. Next week, uh, we will talk about technology, innovation, and organization strategy. Um, so then it's the end of the lectures about innovation per se, and then we uh, focus on the business part of the course. So thanks very much, and I'll see you next week.